Welcome to Season 3 of the Art of Teaching podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you've joined me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed, listened and reviewed the episode. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Professor Alma Harris has held professional posts at the University of Warwick, University College London, the University of Bath and the University of Swansea. She is internationally known for her research and writing on educational leadership, educational policy and school improvement. Alma was a brilliant guest. She was incredibly engaging and so kind and generous with her time. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Professor Alma Harris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Where are you phoning in from? I'm currently phoning in from uh, South Wales, and uh, the, I'm happy to say the weather is is pretty good right now. Great. You are uh, coming into, uh, you're in summer now, I believe? Well, Should yes, we... it, it, is, it is technically called our summer, but our English summers and Welsh summers tend to be rather damp. So at the moment, um, yes, it, it, it is technically summer. Lovely. It, um, it was nine degrees this morning in Australia, and I think there was a whole uh, nation of Australians wondering what to do with that kind of temperature. Um, uh, so <laughs> this is about as cold as it gets for us, um, but it's, uh, I'm always jealous of seeing uh, colleagues and family members, seeing their photographs of Eng- the English summers and the Welsh summers. I, I really miss being there. It's a really beautiful uh, part of the world. Yes, it, yes, it is. And uh, I think we're very blessed with you know, wonderful landscapes, a little bit like Australia, you know, wonderful yeah. contrasts of different landscapes and, and lots yeah. of beautiful beaches. Yeah. Um, quite possibly the most important question, what is your coffee order? Just for when I can finally buy your coffee. Well, I like my coffee strong, so I guess it would be an Americano and uh, with a little bit of milk. Um, I have to say, I, I like my caffeine first thing in the morning. Great. It seems to be a, a very common thread with uh, with teachers and academics. There must be uh, there must be <laughs> something said about it. that. Absolutely. Um, what is a book? It doesn't have to be in your uh, doesn't have to be in your field. But what's a book that's made you stop and reconsider everything? Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question, and I think um, pedag- pedagogy of the oppressed by Freire uh, made me stop and re- reevaluate everything I thought I knew about education. Wow. And and occasionally a book will come along like that, and and a bit like COVID will stop you dead in your tracks and make yeah. you reevaluate everything. So yeah. that in my career, that's one book that I, I return to again and again because I think it's so challenging. Mm. And uh, it asks us some really profound questions about what mm. education is for and, and indeed who it's for. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you, you mentioned you, you come back to that text relatively frequently. Do you find that you get different readings out of it, uh, depending on uh, what stage of life you're reading it through, reading it in? Yeah, I, I, th- I think you do. I mean, like, like all seminal texts, um, they speak to you in different ways in different parts of your life. But I think what this one does is to offer such extreme challenges to the the concept of education that it's mm-hmm. it's it's speak you know it's it's it spoke to me through many decades so i think Fantastic. that is a book that will I'll remain firmly on my bookshelf yeah i'll have to uh, get myself a copy it's always interesting finding out what other um people are reading it's fascinating um if you could have a dinner party with anybody obviously excluding your i mean your family it's more than welcome to go um but uh, <laughs> they don't count in the numbers uh, but uh, who who would you who would be there they can be either past or present. Yeah, well, I, I thought hard about this. And I mean, I, I guess there's a lot of, lot of choices. Um, but I mean, I, I think that if we're talking about leadership, which is what this podcast is about, mm-hmm. um, I, I think Martin Luther King as a Absolutely. supremely moral leader, and uh, I guess JFK as someone who wanted to transform things for the, yeah. for the better. And I think a conversation with the two of those, I think would be very illuminating and, and yeah. very interesting. And, and maybe they could speak to me about leadership in ways I, I hadn't thought. So I, I think they would be really good dinner, dinner companions. 
Fantastic. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's hard to uh, argue with uh, those two uh, those two selections. It sounds like a, a wonderful dinner party, one that I would uh, love to uh, be invited to. Um, I, I'm just um, curious, Alma, what was your uh, upbringing like, and um, what were you? What sort of student were you at school? Um, well, I think my, my background was pretty, pretty, pretty ordinary. Um, I guess in, we would call it working class in, uh, in the UK. Um, and I think that I was a student who probably was underconfident. And I was very fortunate to, to go to two schools where I think the teachers saw potential in me. And I think that, that's, that has to be a very common experience. I mean, at the end of the day, schools uh, make a considerable difference to young people, and we know that. But I think from certain young people from certain backgrounds, they make even more of the difference. And actually, the evidence base shows that quite categorically. Yeah. So I, I think the important thing is on my mind at the moment, and it's one of the questions that comes a bit later. For, so forgive me for, for focusing upon it so early. But I think the issue of equity uh, is, is very important. I mean, talent doesn't understand race, gender, postcodes. Mm, um, you know, talent is just talent. And I think what the job of schools is and, and what they do terrifically well is they spot talent early and they, they ensure that irrespective of background, that yeah. talent is given uh, the, the greatest opportunity and the greatest prominence. So equity, yeah. uh, success for all children in all contexts is, 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 is the, the phrase that I use. Absolutely. And that comes directly from my own experience of, yeah. you know, being in a certain background and now being exposed to, you know, the, the international scholars and an international world. Absolutely, and it, it maybe seems like a silly question, but I'm assuming you, uh, education has um, really transformed your life, like being someone who is now um, internationally renowned and until this COVID pandemic traveled uh, quite extensively. So um, you must obviously believe that education is something that can uh, open and broaden possibilities for students, so otherwise, we're probably in the wrong profession uh, to think that uh, it doesn't make a difference. But um, I, I'm interested as well. Uh, was there a teacher um, th that made a, a significant impact in your life and, and, and for, in a positive way? And, and um, why was that so? Well, I think, yes, there was. There was a, um, a, a teacher in, in my primary school who I, I think did exactly what I've just said, who saw potential. And, and I, I guess reassured me that 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 potential was real and mm. uh, that, that I could do things and I could go places and to believe in myself and I think that self-belief is critical for young people yes. you know of all backgrounds you know that they can do they can achieve um, and I was you know coming from Wales of course you know there are two there are two things that come out of Wales one is teachers the other is preachers that's that's what we're told <laughs> um, because the the belief in education uh, yeah. is so strong. It's like the belief in our rugby team is so strong that it's just in, in, embedded in the culture. So yeah. education is seen as a, a, a great way to yeah. improve yourself and, and remove yourself from, from a context. I mean, I, I don't know if you're talking to Andy Hargreaves, but if you do, Andy's got a great new book out called Moving, and it's all about how he came from Accrington Stanley and then moved into this international global sphere. And it's a similar story, I think, for many of us wow. that, that education has been <clears throat> the, way, the way out of not poverty, yeah. but certainly out of a background where, you know, the horizons may not have been as broad as they, yes. they clearly are for me now. Absolutely. It's so interesting. Um, I'm um, hearing people's experiences of, especially of teachers in primary school. Um, I'm very proud to um, be a, a primary school teacher um, and it, it's interesting and I'm not in any way taking away from a wonderful high school teachers but it's interesting to see um, or to hear people's um, uh, views on, on, on their teachers in the early years and just how formative that was. Um, I remember I went to a school called Long Row Primary School in, um, in Belper and Notting, uh, sorry in Derbyshire and it was a right. beautiful, beautiful part of the world um, but I remember there was a teacher there that I knew that every time I walked through her doors I felt known and valued and cared for. And I'm sure she did that to the 35 other students in her class. But for me, it was such a significant feeling. And I don't remember um, how I learned how to measure, measure angles or how I learned how to, uh, to do subtraction in my head. All I remember is how this particular teacher um, made me feel in the interaction yeah. with her. And 
um, it, it's so interesting to hear the stories behind people that have done such significant things as yourself and, and realizing that the foundation there was laid in many ways by great teachers um, and the schools yes. being such sacred places. And, and what, what's in interesting, Matthew, is mm -hmm. that, that teacher um, who really did, I think, you're, you're right about primary schools, yeah. elementary schools, setting down, I think, yes. um, a, very, a very clear pattern of self-belief, and that's so important for young people. Um, and that, that teacher who, I, who really did allow me to set down some very positive patterns about my ability, yeah. um, rang me up after he retired and just wow. basically said, he was very proud of me and that was like you know full circle yes. very emotional but I was able to say well actually I've done this largely because of your influence so thank yeah. you yeah that, that's that's so wonderful and um I remember for me um I mean my parents went uh, they separated when I was quite young but we went from a, a particularly well-to-do background but for me um I remember um uh, sitting in our local library and discovering the wonder of of literature and children's books and 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 listening at the time to audio cassettes about books and stories and it was just for me in many ways reading and literacy and learning was I wouldn't go as far as to say it was escape from reality but it definitely helped me to see outside of my circumstances and I think yeah. um, uh, the town that I was from was very um, a very hard working um, lower to middle class town. Um, a lot of people went away to universities, and so um, it was uh, it was a really beautiful place to to uh, to be brought up. But for me, education was that thing that that got me outside of my my bubble. And I think for so many people, it's it plays such a pivotal part in the upbringing. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. That. And I think the other thing, Matthew, is yeah, you've got to remember that the, the teachers <laughs> create all other professions and. Mm -hmm. This is why the best That's profession true. in the world, because without teachers, there'd be no doctors, there'd be no nurses, there'd be no people working on the virus. So one of the big messages I always give is, you know, teachers are so important. The profession is so important. It's pivotal yeah. to every other part of society. So yeah. let's not forget how important teachers are, like yeah. yourself and other teachers who give every day 110%, yeah. irrespective of how they're feeling. Um, and I think in COVID times, that's been that's been seen way more visibly because they've had their issues, their problems, they've been ill, they've had Absolutely. you know all sorts of challenges themselves. But every day, you know, they've they've got on their laptops and uh, they've they've done what they always do in all in all crises. They, they've yeah. put children first. Uh, I yeah. think that's that's what that's what great teachers do. They always put children first. Absolutely. And there's so much and we will uh, a little later on, we'll definitely unpack some of your incredible work on school leadership in crisis and what that means for this new landscape of leadership and school uh, and schools. But I'm really um, interested, Alma, to, to find out how would you define uh, how do you define the concept leadership? And also, do you think it's something that has uh, changed or is changing over time? That second question is quite an obvious question, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I got a very simple view of leadership. I know people make it really complex, but I think leadership, when you when you, when you distill it right down, it comes down to influence. So my my example of JFK and Martin Luther King, I mean, it's because they had such significant influence on the world. Um, now, influence, as we know, can be for good or for bad, and we're not saying that all leadership is good. And I think that's an issue that we have to recognise that influence can be misused mm, as well absolutely. as used wisely. Um, I mean, one of the things I think that we've done uh, in, in the field of leadership is we've made it more complicated and we've fractured the concept. So you, we have what Ken Leithwood calls adjectival leadership. So you get an ad adjective, you stick it in front of the word leadership and there you go, you've got another concept. And I, I think that that's been a bit unfortunate because it's it's taken away the simplicity of leadership, which is about human relationships and influence, and that's that's in essence what leadership is. Oh, um, absolutely. And, and you, you go to any airport, and there'll be thousands of books on leadership. Well, if you can go to an airport ever again, um, when those bookshops were open, and, and you know you you. You, you get confused in a way by the different adjectives and the different terminology. So you have to return to what matters most in leadership and that's influence mm. and relationships and, yeah. and, and, and a very clear focus on what matters most. 
Absolutely. And you'd, um, it's just made me thought of then, um, I, I call it, colleague of yours, Professor John Hattie, um, writes yep. extensively about the uh, effect sizes to do with different types of leadership. And um, I was just, I'm just interested, um, uh, you argue that distributed leadership is based upon independent uh, interaction and practice rather than individual, individual and independent actions associated yep. with those formal leadership roles or responsibilities. Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful. I should have taken a breath. <laughs> um, so how do we begin to even implement these concepts in school environments that are traditionally pretty regulated and really structured? Um, what, what, what can we do in those environments to help build that leadership capacity? Well, I, I think that um, distributed leadership has always been there in schools. We've just not, never really had a way of looking at it and Absolutely. Jim Spillane from Northwestern University in Chicago was the first person to really look at distributed leadership and, and really put a theoretical lens on it but also a very practical lens and, and basically say you know in most complex organizations and school is a co complex organization you know you've got many leaders at different levels and the interactions and the influence goes go in various directions and I think that takes us quite nicely to the concept of teacher leadership. Absolutely. And, and that doesn't mean leadership in the formal sense with a role and responsibility and a title. It just simply means that on a daily basis, most teachers are influencing each other and they're influencing young people and they're influencing the community. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about distributed leadership. Um, one of the things I, I think we've learned from COVID is that we cannot rely any longer on the leadership of one person to get us through um, and what we've seen is a way more collaborative way of working now John Hattie talks quite categorically about the effect size of, of collaboration amongst professionals yes. so we know it makes a significant difference so if you can extrapolate from that then if leadership is shared if, if leadership is distributed if leadership is collaborative then you've got far more power uh, in the organization mm. than if you just relied on one individual. You know, that, in a sense, that model has been significantly challenged. Doesn't mean we don't need a head teacher, doesn't mean we don't need someone with the overall vision and mm. sense of direction, but it speaks to the, important, the importance of teacher agency yeah. and teacher influence and the recognition that teachers are critically important and their leadership matters. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's like, it's so fascinating as well. And I, there's so many sort of, I think so much needs to be said about the environment in which these um, cultures can be built, um, whether it be a, in terms of psychological safety. I know Amy Edmondson writes extensively about that, the role of yep. leadership and ego and, and, and letting go of power and uh, authority, I think is, it's really lovely to see that starting to, uh, in my experience, starting to change um, uh, quite dramatically. I mean, you write, uh, sorry, you, you, you quoted um, uh, um, Azorin in 2020 and it says that COVID-19 has been a supernova creating undeniable chaos. And that quote as well comes from Hargraves and Fullen. And, and yep. you argue that it shook the very fabric of education. So how is this, we've been through, I've been teaching for 14 years now and I thought I'd seen a crisis before this one, but how is this one uh, different to other crises that we've experienced and, 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 and what, where can we go from here? Because we also, we don't know how long this is gonna last. No. Um, maybe, I can be maybe I can be controversial then, because I think that the difference is that this crisis is external to education. Whereas I think a lot of the crises that we see yeah. are actually filled within education. So in other words, you know, yeah. policy directions may change, or as soon as the PISA results come out, everybody, gets into a panic and policymakers start, you know, doing things to schools and doing things to systems. And sometimes that creates a crisis because if it, if it wasn't broken, then why fix it? Mm. Um, this crisis is externally manufactured. We have no control over it. I mean, you can, you can control a policy environment to a certain extent because you can start to tweak it. And, yeah, yeah. But this crisis, uh, we, we, we couldn't control. So essentially the only thing we could control uh, was our response to the crisis. And I think schools, uh, teachers, school leaders stood up to that challenge incredibly well. Yes. It doesn't mean it was perfect, but I think that they did their level best and are still doing their level bests to get 
young people through the most difficult time yeah. uh, that, that education in all countries has, has ever experienced. Um, it did, sh it, it, it's, it remains, I, I guess, uh, shaking the foundation, that, that remains. But I think we've got better understanding our responses to it. Um, I, I, if you think at the outset, you know, the, the thought of not being in a school, the thought of teaching remotely, the thought of, you know, being online with your colleagues was just alien. And how quickly we've managed to cope and learn and adapt to that environment. And, and that's down to the incredible ingenuity of teachers to cope, you know? And leadership sometimes is doing something positive when you don't know what to do. And there is no clear answer. There, there are no blueprints for this. There is no silver bullet. Yeah. So I think it's, it's huge, uh, I, I guess, um, a huge privilege to watch an education system uh, just come together and just be able to mobilize itself to deal yeah. with unpredictability, yeah. instability, and constant change. Yeah. And I think that's down to, as I say, you know, the capability, the competence, the willingness, and the skill base of teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I thought, um, I thought teaching was probably the only profession that couldn't go online because you had to be in front of your students and how, uh, how wrong was I uh, just to yeah. see uh, the, the um, in the Australian context, we, we were at school one day and then the next day we weren't. I don't know if that's yep. the same over in um, the United Kingdom. It yes. uh, yes. was a very, very quick change and it forced us to very, very quickly um, uh, adapt and pivot. And, and, and I am, uh, as you mentioned, so impressed and so um, proud of the teaching profession for their ability to pivot and, and also um, distill this incredibly complex profession down to its essential elements. And that's student connection and engagement and yeah. meaningful interactions with young people. And it's been a really wonderful to see. And I don't know what the future looks like. Um, but I am um, uh, continually amazed with the, with the resilience of these incredible professionals to get up and do their job while their world at home may be falling apart. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, uh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and Matthew, I don't know if you saw yesterday, but there was a huge celebration of the National Health Service in, see that. in, yes. in the United, United Kingdom. And, and I think, you know, there should be a huge celebration globally for teachers in the same way, because what they've done and the way they've kept learning going in the most difficult of circumstances is is qu quite frankly incredible yeah absolutely um i'm like we've talked about obviously a lot of the sort of the positives and the incredible things that we've seen um uh, seen happen in schools but what are some of the things that this pandemic has exposed i mean um i know in australia there has been masses massive issues around equity and access um but you talked uh, before just just before we hit record what are some of the things that this crisis has exposed about uh, teaching learning systems and how can we move forward from that? Well, I, I think the main thing that we can't put back in the box is, yeah. is the issue of equity. I mean, it's exposed that. I mean, yes. the a technological divide we can't ignore any longer. And in, in a sense, um, if, if we can adapt our teaching and learning practices in schools, to uh, be more equitable around, around online learning, then we can do it for face-to-face, -face. we can do it uh, more generally. I mean, I think it's raised a question about what, what do we do in classrooms? And is there a possibility of a more blended learning approach? And could mm. that be more effective for some mm. learners? And I think it's, it's challenged a little bit of the, the grammar of schooling, you know, the, the, the norm of schooling and, yes. and whether we do need uh, schooling organized in the way that we, we had it before the pandemic and whether there are things that we've learned during the pandemic that are actually better, more productive and more helpful to students. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've learned, of course, is the importance of community. I've talked about collaboration, but also mm -hmm. community. Absolutely. You know, parents, carers, the wider community have all stepped back to support schools, to support education in ways that we haven't seen before. And I think that's been an enormous achievement and something we wouldn't want to lose again. Um, so so I, one of your, your questions is about whether we should return 
to, to where we were and my answer to that is categorically no I, I don't believe in looking backwards yes I don't believe in hoping for a better time in some sort of you know imaginary yeah. day when everything was wonderful because school schools and education are not like that it's never yeah. perfect we're all we're always trying to be a better version of ourselves the next day and I think that's what teachers do yeah. um I, I'm not sure returning to normal is a good idea I think you know we can actually take some of the things we've learned during the COVID times that have worked in schools that are working for young people yes you know, the focus on equity the focus on community the better yeah. collaboration between professionals and just say hey you know this is a better direction than where we were are you um are you confident that um within these very sort of structured and regulated education systems are you confident that uh we will be able to redefine this new normal or do you think are you fearful that we will spring back to old habits i i think i think education is getting redefined as we speak as teachers you know yeah. teachers practices have changed yeah and, and ultimately teachers practices define education teachers practices define what students learn um so this this idea that we can go back to the halcyon days when everything was sort of a lot better pre-COVID, I think is a bit it's a bit misleading. Yes. And misguided. I think we we should do what other um, other professions are doing, like the medical profession, and learn. And we've learned a lot through this crisis, and and we can uh, build a better education system as a result of what we've learned. So yes. no going backwards. Uh, hold on to the things that are valuable, of course. But let's just let go of the things that we did, because we've always done them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've got a quote from you, and I just wanted to um, maybe have a conversation afterwards about some of the essential qualities of these new leadership programs that you think will will have emerged as a result of this. And, and, and you quote, a new leadership order has emerged, uh, which has no leadership standards, no preparation or development programs, no inspection frameworks, no KPIs, no benchmarks. There are no precedents, no ring binders, no uh, blueprints to help school leaders through the current maelstrom that is COVID-19. Um, so going back to my original question, what do you think are some of the, the new skills and attributes of leaders and um, that we need to be developing uh, currently for an uncertain uh, for an uncertain future in schools. Yeah, I mean, that was a, a pretty long sentence, but I think in short, it was Very saying- long. Sorry, it's quite what? late over here, my apologies. No, no, uh, I'm just reflecting on the sentence itself. And I think, you know, in short, it, what it says is that the way we prepared leaders before, it, it is now not appropriate to the leadership that we're seeing that's Absolutely. basically it so well, well summarized yes yeah. yeah so so we need to recognize that there are new skills that leaders need because we're i i can't imagine that this unpredictable state is going to magically transform itself into stability anytime soon so yeah. we've got to prepare our leaders for crisis management right for for, for, for situations they can't even anticipate um, we've got to prepare them to be technologically literate and digitally competent because without those skills, we couldn't have survived in the last 16 months. Um, I think we've got to prepare them to work way more collaboratively and to draw upon the expertise of others in an organisation. And I think it, it's redefined leadership because if you're sitting in splendid isolation in your office, that's not leadership. It may be management, but it's not leadership. And I think this crisis has taught us that our best leaders have been out there talking to other professionals, talking to the community, talking to students, you know, that hub of what I talked about earlier, influence and relationships. And I think building those positive relationships going forward is gonna be a key skill of leadership. It always has been, but what happens in the policy context is you get distracted by other things. Well, I think we, it, this, is, this has taught us what is most important and relationships are most important. And that's what, that's what good leaders do. They build positive relationships so positive change can happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's more important now than ever before to have those interpersonal skills and those abilities to be able to relate and to talk with and to collaborate with other um, whether other professionals or other community members, I think that's um, so incredibly important. Um, uh, recently, you wrote um, 
an article about school leadership in crisis. Um, for those people that haven't had their opportunity of reading that, and I'll place all of these links um, in the show notes so people can, uh, what's the, the, the premise um, of that piece? And also, um, uh, what, what can we learn from your, your, your research? Beth? I think I think the premise of that piece is the really extent, yeah. yeah, the extent of the challenges yeah. that have faced leaders in schools in all our different contexts, and I guess what I try and do in that piece is I try and remind people that leaders in schools, leaders everywhere, are human beings at the end of the day, Absolutely. and I think the one thing that has come out of all of this is the need. For leaders to invest in their own self-care mm. and their own well-being and you know putting themselves first uh, is, is, is critically important because right now we, in, in England, in Australia, other parts of the world, um, many leaders are running on empty. You know they have, they've given everything, they're exhausted and there's nothing else to give. So I think this main idea of, of self-care and, and being a little bit kind um, to yourself during this crisis is, is absolutely key. Leaders are no different from, from the rest of us. They, they're not immune to, to the effects of COVID or, or, or the, the, the fallout. But I think it's reminded us of the importance of um, those individual leaders in the system. You mm. know, they're not infallible, they are imperfect and they need the support and the help from others within the organization just to get through this. We've seen that in spades. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, for me personally, who's a relatively uh, a new, um, well, for the last four years or so, being a, a, leader, a leader within a school, um, it's sometimes really hard to, to show that human side because you, you mm. want to be somebody that has it all together and you want to be someone yeah. that is, follow me, I know where I'm going, but, but sometimes it's really hard and, and I, I know I'm um, many times speaking to my um, supervisor and saying, look, I'm sort of this bubbly person who's excited and let's go and have it. But, but sometimes it gets too much. And I think having those honest conversations and I think yeah. um, in the Australian context, I, I think this pandemic is definitely, um, I don't know if we'll, sorry, we'll see the, the full impacts of this in terms of mental health and wellbeing for, for many, many years to come. Do, do you think that's a, uh, that's shared across, sorry, where you are over in Wales? Do you think that we will, um, be dealing with the the overflow of this pandemic in terms of mental health for for a really long time. I, I think I think we will. I mean, I, I think schools are very good at recalibrating themselves, mm -hmm. and I think you know we've managed. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, but we've managed to take young people through assessments, um, and they're they're able to progress. But but yeah, I mean, I think the hidden depths of this pandemic we haven't seen yet because I think it takes time for trauma to emerge okay yeah. but I think Matthew your point there about honesty you know the worst thing that you can do as a leader is to pretend that you're okay right yeah. and, and I think the importance of leaders talking about the struggles that they face with other leaders and being really honest and asking for support isn't vulnerability it's actually strength yeah absolutely um um, I, I just uh, briefly, I'd love to hear about your own uh, leadership journey, and this is not a, a question that was in the notes, so forgive me. Um, but how have you changed um, as a as a leader, and how do you uh, do? You look back on your early days of leadership, and uh, are you uh, do you cringe, or are you uh, or, <laughs> or are you uh, uh, grateful for, for yeah for where you've come from? Like, what were you like as an early leader, and and what would you what advice would you give to yourself many years ago yeah I, I think the advice I'd give to myself many years ago is to understand the difference between management and leadership absolutely because they, they they look similar but they're distinctively different in terms of what happens what the outcome is and I think I was a pretty good manager I was a middle manager in school mm -hmm. um, and then I went to be uh, a, a leader in the university um, but I think my leadership journey like so many others it, it has been uh, I guess uh, imperfect, and I and I keep on coming back to this idea of imperfect leadership, and it's actually Steve Mumby who's written about that. And, and I think you know if we all recognise we are imperfect, and we're just trying to be a better version of ourselves the next day. And and I think the the critical thing about leadership is what you learn from your mistakes, 
not your successes, what you learn from your mistakes and whether you can recover, whether you can, uh, I guess, change your practice and whether you can be really honest with yourself about what, what's gone well and what's not gone so well. Um, the book by Jim Collins um, talks about uh, level five leadership. And he says, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you get something wrong, you look in the mirror. If you get something right, you look out of the window and you look at your organization. And I think that summarizes what mm. leaders do. They, they, they should be very self-reflective. Um, not to the point of, you know, analysis, paralysis, analyzing everything they do. But I think that self-awareness and knowing, you know what, I got that wrong. And I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned uh, in my career, I guess, is to have the humility to apologize when you've got it wrong. Yeah. And to not just say, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm infallible. I don't make mistakes. And I think that's the biggest weakness of leaders, actually, yeah. is to believe that they're infallible or, or believe that they have to be infallible. Yeah. This, this, this is not a perfect exercise. Yeah. <laughs> there are no blueprints, as I've said in the article. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a, you know, you'll find, Matthew, that you, as you go through your career, you, you might look back now and think, mm, I, I probably shouldn't have said that or done that. And, and the important thing is not to be too self-critical, but to say, mm. well, actually, next time, what will I do differently? Yeah. What have I learned? I think leaders are always learning and always yeah. trying to refine their practice. Yeah, I, I think that's so uh, so wonderfully said. I mean, I look back on my early years of, of being a classroom teacher and thank goodness me, I, I, I thought I was good at portraying this illusion of having it all together. Um, but then you realise yeah. that everyone knows that you don't know what you're doing. And I think in, in terms mm. of um, and leadership, I think that's that's the case as well. I mean, always having, um, I've worked in some incredible schools with very robust teams and um, I I welcome feedback. It's not always comfortable, but, um, and uh, also I've been married for 13 years and my wife will give me feedback whether I, I <laughs> asked for or not. Um, and so I think that's really, really important to be uh, continuously um, self-reflective and also changing your practice. Uh, I think it's uh, really wonderful. Um, Alma, I'm just uh, curious, what is um, uh, what is something that you're really proud of um, in your career and something that you are, um, uh, yeah, sorry, what is something that you're really proud of? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there's a huge amount to be proud of in, in all our professional careers. Yeah. Everybody has lots of things to be proud about. Um, but one of the things I'm most proud about is I was having a conversation with um, a colleague when I first uh, became a professor. And I remember her saying to me, so, so what sort of professor do you want to be then? And I thought that was a very strange question because I thought there was only one sort of professor. And, and like you, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing uh, and, uh, and what professors did. And, you know, I knew some of the things, but not all of the things. And she said, so what sort of professor do you want to be? And I thought about that long and hard. And I said to her, you know what? I, I said, I'd like to be uh, a teacher's professor. I'd like to be able to speak to the profession in ways that are credible and authentic and meaningful, and that I do research that helps them to understand their practice more yeah. or helps them. And I think that stuck with me. And if you, if you said to me, what am I most proud of? I think, I'm hoping anyway, that my body of work and what I've done and who I am still connects to the profession in ways that are authentic and valuable to them. Yeah, I, I think that's that's so important. I know for me, the most powerful articles that I've read or the, the most uh, impacting conferences that I've been to are ones that um, impact the next day in which I stand in front of my class. Um, and so being able to get up in front of your class and actually take something and use it and implement it, I think is is so important. And um, it's so wonderful to um, to read your work and and. and it's so applicable and it's written in a language that people that are maybe not necessarily have that background in academia can really understand. So thank you for communicating in, in a way that is uh, so accessible. And I know that there are generations of teachers that are um, um, whose practice has been impacted and students whose lives have been changed as a result of reading some of your research. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that. And I look forward to your body of research is staggering, so it's going to take me a bit of time to get through it. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I really am yeah, looking forward to discovering more about your work. I'm incredibly grateful. So um, thank you so much. Um,
Not at all. I just a couple more questions. I want to be uh, respectful of your time. Um, but um, what currently? And you've talked um, obviously in depth about leadership and so on and so forth. But what specifically has your attention at the moment? What problem are you trying to solve in terms of your research? Problems. The, there's probably a few. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think the the, the, co the COVID context is something that interests yeah. me and the way in which people have been responding to that. And I've talked at length about that, and I've also talked about the issue of equity. And I I guess yeah, what challenges me at the moment is is thinking about that relationship between equity and excellence. And I know Pardon yes. Salberg, who you've talked to, uh, Yong Zhao, uh, lots of my international colleagues have focused on that carol campbell from uh, ontario and it's really how do we how do we ensure that we get equity into a system and it's balanced with excellence because so many systems are driven by excellence and equity is almost an afterthought and, and mm -hmm. i mean we're seeing now in canada and, and you know from being in australia that the inequities on a daily basis that you you see in young people um, are, are the most challenging and I think that's if we can just really focus our attention on educational equity mm. success for all kids in all contexts you know even if that even if I'm told that's an unrealistic goal um, I, I still think it's worth fighting for um, I think it's, it's absolutely worth fighting for and it, it's worth on a daily basis just saying like you said Matthew you know how do we get equity then you know I get asked that question all the time and I said, well, you start with schools. And I said, you start with a teacher who notices a child. You start with a teacher who engages with a child. You start with a teacher that gives confidence to a child from a background where that doesn't exist. Mm. Not everybody mm. comes to school with the same social capital, as you heard me talk about at the start. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, schools can do a lot. I think communities can do even more. But I think ultimately, and this is where I will be controversial, it would be really good if governments around the world just stopped focusing on PISA results and start focusing on, on equity. And maybe you shifted some of that resource to providing more equitable outcomes for young people. Yeah. Um, and I think Absolutely. that's more than equality, that's taking down some of the barriers that, as we know, Matthew, exist in, in, in all cultures and yeah. uh, all education systems. But that's the priority, I think, going forward. Gosh, it sounds like a lofty goal, but one that is uh, worth fighting for. Um, I'd prefer yeah. to have unrealistic or high expectations than uh, than to lower expectations. So it's, it sounds really, um, it's such an important thing to be tackling. So thank you for that. Um, what advice would you give to people that are considering um, entering our wonderful profession? Um. Interestingly, I mean, uh, uh, we've, we've just finished our teacher training program at the University of Swansea, and um, mm. I was asked to write something. We were all asked to write something, some advice to those yeah. teachers who are taking up their first post. And my advice was, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, you have time. And I think that message is so important because, you know, you're not going to be the, the perfectly crafted version of a teacher when you go into a school. There's lots, there's lots mm. to learn. So yeah, I think that would be my advice. You know, don't don't be too hard on yourself. You'll have terrible lessons. <laughs> you wonder why you ever entered the profession. You, you know, you you worry about your own ability. But then you'll have good days. And young people, you know, you will never know the impact that you have on young people. And yeah. that's the beauty of the profession: is yeah. you you are planting trees that you'll never see full grown. But you know that if you plant them correctly, to continue that analogy you know, young people are going to thrive and be the best that they can be. And hopefully they'll become teachers, you know, in years to come. Fantastic. Um, Professor Alma Harris, that is sounds like a wonderful um, place to wrap things up. I'm so, so grateful that you would take the time uh, to talk with me um, this evening for me or this morning for you. And yeah. um, I, I'm incredibly um, grateful for all of the work that you're doing and for what you're investing into our wonderful profession. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Matthew. Thank you for your time and all, all the very best with, uh, with, with this, this COVID scenario. And uh, as I say, you know, teachers have done a fantastic job and continue to do a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye.
Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussion. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. I've one favour to ask. If you could please head to the iTunes page of the podcast and rate and review the episode. This would really help to get the interviews and resources to as many people as possible. Also, I've created a private Facebook group so that we can continue the discussion after each episode. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and until next time.